Are humans part of nature? This is a question that has been debated by philosophers and scientists for centuries. Living in our modern cities, one could be mistaken to think that humans and human society has not so much to do with the natural world. But surrounded by the concrete jungle, it is easy to forget that the links between modern mega cities and the surrounding natural world are very close. Cities are artificial environments created for our own benefit. But at the same time, none of this liberates us from nature. City dwellers have to be fed, they need water and energy to stay warm, run air conditioning or to drive cars. A bigger city means more people, and more people means that more resources and energy must be extracted from the surrounding area in order to sustain the city population. This also results in more waste, which is usually dumped in the environment. The need for more food and resources leads to intensification of land use. And as a result, remodeling of the earth in order to suit our own purposes. We carve up the fields, turn prairies into woodlands, deserts into gardens, and paradise into desert. We fell forests where we find them, and plant them where none existed before. We build large dams and rivers, extinguish some species, and call others into being by selection and hybridization. We do not only take from nature, but we put things back as well, which leads to environmental pollution. Peoples in cities are washing clothes, they're washing dishes and they go to the toilet. The waste produced in this way is often flushed into watercourses, like this image of industrial water pollution in the Netherlands in the 1970s shows. What happened here was that industrial pollution was making water unsuitable for drinking. Preparing food and the use of packaging materials also creates waste. And this ends very often up in landfills. Cars, Fires to heat our homes and stoves to cook on pollute the air because of the use of wood, coal and gas. Cars contribute to this problem causing smog. But this is not a new phenomenon. Already in the 17th century people were complaining about the bad air quality in cities like York and London. During the Industrial Revolution new industrial centres in Northern England gave the region its infamous name of the Black Country. This was caused by soot that belched from the industrial smokestacks. However, the worst smog disaster in Britain was the famous London smog of December 1952, in which about 3,000 people died as a consequence. One of the paradoxes of the human story is that the more we intervene to change the environment, the more vulnerable we become to ecological change, disaster and unpredictable effects, such as climate change, disappearance of species or the drying up of lakes like the Aral Sea. The latter was caused by diverting water for agriculture. Humans dominate over other species and the landscape, but we remain linked to them by the food chain. We transform our environment, but we can never escape from it. This means that if we neglect the environment, we neglect the framework of everything else that happens to us. For this reason, historians have become more interested in the interaction between humans and their environment in the past. The most obvious of influences is the weather and climate. This affects us on a daily basis, but it is also important for the production of food. When it's too dry, no crops can be grown to sustain considerable numbers of people. Too wet, and crops will be destroyed, leading to famine. It also can lead to flooding, causing damage and loss of life. Historians are interested in how climate fluctuations have influenced human societies in the past. History has to be about climate because although climate determines nothing, it conditions many things. It has to be about the winds and the currents because throughout the age of sail, they channeled and funneled long-range communications. Wind has also been important to drive industrial machines, such as the windmills of the Dutch Golden Age. Who has not heard of the Little Ice Age, the colder period affecting Europe from the 15th through 19th centuries, and the beautiful paintings that resulted from this?
The downside was that villages in the Alps were overrun by the rapidly expanding glaciers and that the growing season was shortened by a couple of months making populations more vulnerable to famine. In recent years we have become more concerned about global warming caused by the burning of fossil fuels. Climate historians are interested in how the climate changed in the past and how people responded to this. One of the surprises of this research is that humans have influenced climate since the invention of agriculture. The clearing of forests and steppes of the earth for agricultural purposes has released vast quantities of methane and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. This in turn has kept the earth warmer than it would have been otherwise. However, the high level of greenhouse gases are punctuated by pandemic killings of large numbers of people. As a result, forests could grow back on abandoned agricultural fields, soaking up carbon from the atmosphere, cooling the climate. This also points at the importance of disease in world history. The best known example of disease shaping world events is probably the Black Death, which spread from Central Asia to Europe in the 14th century and caused the death of at least a quarter of the European population. In its wake, nature took back abandoned agricultural fields and numbers of many animals, such as the wolf, expanded. Is this perhaps the source of many scary stories in Europe? Over the past 500 years, the swapping of biota across oceans and between continents has shaken up many ecosystems. Every history student should now know that alongside the great political, social, economic and intellectual revolutions, we have to place the ecological revolution that is now commonly called the Colombian Exchange. The Colombian Exchange has been one of the most significant events in the history of world ecology. The term is used to describe the enormous widespread exchange of agricultural goods between eastern and western hemispheres that occurred after 1492, the year that Columbus sailed to America. Columbus did not only bring Spanish conquistadores, but also animals, plants and disease that were unknown to the Native American population. The most spectacular result was the epidemics caused by the diseases brought by Europeans, which killed over 90% of the population of the Americas. They had never been in contact with diseases such as smallpox or measles and had therefore no resistance to these nasty viruses. This is just one example of a biological exchange, but there are countless other ones and it still continues at present with the introduction of so-called alien species in many parts of the world. These are only a few examples of what environmental history is about, but there are many more areas that receive the attention of environmental historians. In essence, to put it in the words of historian Donald Worcester, environmental history explores the ways in which the biophysical world has influenced the course of human history and the ways in which people have thought about and tried to transform their surroundings. The environment is one of the most pressing concerns facing society in the 21st century. The environmental debate is hugely complex with cultural, social, economic, moral, political and scientific dimensions all interacting. Key to this debate is environmental history, which provides an indispensable long-term perspective on change.